that. OK, so let's actually go through the rest of the math. Um, so this is really the point that I want you to get across, that inductor register change in current. So that whenever you have inductor, the, yeah. Um, all right, so I have this circuit. Um, I want to write my analysis, so I will uh, do the same thing we were doing before, define a loop to write down my Kirchhoff's uh, loop rule. It. So I want to reuse as much of that as possible. Um, so I would have to define my loop this way. Starting here, uh, I think I want to go clockwise again and go this way. All right, that seems reasonable. Um, OK, any questions? No? All right. Um, so, so this is the leftover from the RC circuit. So I'm going to change, um, you know, so, so this part is the same. I'm going to change some of these terms so that it now matches with my LR circuit. And um, I'll do that in black. So the very first term, this was written in for the capacitor, which I don't have anymore. So I should change it with my inductor term. So I'm looking for voltage difference as I go across inductor. Well, lucky me that I already have that written there. So it's going to be inductance times di dt. Um, I have to go over the sign. Is it plus or minus? So this is where you kind of have to think it through. Um, so I hook up the battery. So there's going to be positive current starting to flow. Uh, well, starting from 0. And what I'm interested in is actually sign of DIDT. So will DIDT be positive or negative? As I, I don't know, hook up the battery and charge up the inductor. Positive, right? DIDT increases from 0 to some non-zero value. We'll just define this direction as being positive. All right, so they'll be positive. Um, now, the voltage change across inductor, do we want a voltage rise or voltage drop? Like, what makes it intuitive sense to you? That the voltage should rise or that the voltage should drop? drop, right? It takes effort to put things through the inductor. So which means the overall term that I want to associate with this should be a negative term. So since DIDT is positive, this should be minus LDIDT. Good. No questions? Okay, so I don't have Q anymore. So that probably means that thing in the box is not going to be needed. So let me erase that. All right, uh, can I leave this one alone, the one with the register? Yeah, minus IR, seems right to me. Um, can I leave the third term alone? Uh, as I go across the battery, plus or minus? Yeah, actually, I can leave that one alone, too. Looks like I'm done. How many unknowns do I have in this equation? Just one, I. So in some sense, actually, inductor circuit is simpler <laughs> than the capacitor circuit. The reason we do capacitor first is because uh, I think a capacitor is conceptually easier to understand. Inductor is conceptually harder. Um, even the whole this thing that inductor register change in current, uh, it's a more advanced concept than so. Anyways, but yeah, so this is the equation, and so I see the only unknown is um, current. So really, my goal here is to solve for uh, what current is as a function of time, and once I know that, then uh, I can find out anything else I want. I can find out the voltage across inductor, whatever. So let's uh, go through the steps to try to do that. Um, I'm going to do the same thing I did the last time. Solve this for the highest order derivative term. Right. So I'm going to solve it for di dt. That's equal to, so I move this over, divide up by L. Um, so I'm left to it, v naught minus um, i r and I divide it through by L. All right. Um, so separation of variables again? Yes? Uh, let me do a couple, um, a simple algebraic manipulation before I do the separation of variable. I want to collect the terms in a way that will make sense later on. So I want to collect terms this way. 
Find out over L minus R over L times I. Um, and for a reason of my own, I'm going to rewrite this this way. Um, let's see. I'm going to rewrite this as, how does it go? Mm. I want to factor out 1 over L over R. Don't ask me to explain why, only that what I'm doing is mathematically valid. I want to factor out this 1 over L R, which may sound strange because first term doesn't have any R. But this is what I mean by factoring out 1 over L R. The, this term is going to turn, of, turn into V naught over R. You see how this is the factored version of this, right? Multiply this, you get V naught over L minus just the I. Okay. Any questions? So there's a reason I factored it this way. The thing I have factored out here, um, it's a constant. It only has L and R in it, right? And so, and you know, when I do separation of variables, I only need to move this term over to the other side, because this is the only uh, factor that has a variable I in it. Good. And there's, I mean, there were a couple other ways you could have done this, but the particular way I did it, it has one more additional advantage, and that advantage is that this particular quantity here, L over R. If you work out the unit, work out the unit on your own, you will find that this has a unit of time. So if you are thinking back to how you figured out the time constant for the RC circuit, this is the time constant for the LR circuit. So we'll go through the math and see how, where that comes in. So all right, so having that done all of that, let me actually go on ahead and separate the variables. So separation of variables gets me this. Uh, separation of variables. So I'm going to collect this term on the di side. So I have di over v naught over r minus i. That's equal to, I'm going to move dt term over to the other side. Um, dt divided by L over R. Hmm. I have the urge to multiply this through by minus one again, but uh, this time let me actually do it the other way. So let me show you what you would have gotten if you didn't multiply through by minus one, <laughs> like I did last time. Um, so here, um, like, is, does everything look okay if we just start integrating now? Right, yeah, everything here in terms of i, everything here in terms of t, or, and it's nothing other than t. Um, so yeah, I can just actually start integrating, so let me do that. So here the integral, um, so I'm always going to do definite integral, so that means I have, say, it's t equal to zero to some final time t final, so here, current, what's my initial current? Zero. Yeah, zero. So i goes from zero to some final value, i final, that I'm going to find later. All right. Um, and I'm going to actually do the same thing I did the last time. I'm not going to do any u substitution. Oh, actually, you know, let me do it the other way. Uh, let me do the u substitution. <laughs> um, so this time, the u substitution will be all right, I have this thing, so I do this substitution. U is equal to V naught over R minus I, so DU is equal to minus DI. Good? Plug it in. Um, this is what you end up with. DI becomes minus DU over, this becomes U. And when you integrate it, now you have to remember that you are putting the limits in terms of u. So for the lower limit, you plug in i equals 0. So u, whatever that is, goes from v over r to u at the upper limit, v over r minus i final. v over r minus i final. 
All right, so that's the left-hand side. Right-hand side doesn't actually, well, let me just do the right-hand side. It doesn't look all that complicated. So do the integral. It's t over L over r, plug in t final. So you end up with the t final over L over r on the right-hand side. And if you want, uh, this is the step where you can actually move the minus sign over to the other side. So whichever way you go, you will eventually end up with your minus sign on the other side. So let me actually do that now. Multiply through by minus 1, now that I have some reason to do that. So this becomes plus, this becomes minus. OK. Um, Let's wrap this up. So the, in the anti derivatives of 1 over u is logarithm. So it becomes, so the um, whole equation here becomes the natural log of um, u. Um, so I'm just going to plug in the limits at this step also. So upper limit, v over r minus i final, v over r minus i final. So ln root natural log of this minus natural log of this simplifies to natural log of upper limit divided by natural log of the, or divided by the lower limit, v over r. Good? Questions? All right, so all of this is uh, equal to this. So let me write out the cleaned up version over there and solve it for i final. So um, so this is the cleaned up version. Natural log of v over r minus i final over v over r is equal to minus t final over l over r. So you, a lot of steps will begin to look familiar because you have the natural log again. So you are raising this to power of e again so that you get rid of natural log. So the left hand side becomes uh, v over r minus i final over v over r. That's equal to here um, um, e to the minus t, fin uh, t final over L over R. So this is where it actually begins to look like the time constant that you saw last time. Um, all right, so I have to solve for I final. So what that means is I multiply through by V over R. So V over R here. Move I final on to that side. Move this over to this side. Okay? So when I do all of that, this is what you end up with. You end up with i final is equal to. Um, so actually, I can factor. Uh, let me let me uh, not skip more steps. So when you write down what I just described, it becomes i final equals v over r that was left over on the original side minus this term that you moved over, v over r times e to the minus t final over L over R. Everyone good with this so far? Yes? OK, so let me factor out V over R. I mean, that was the obvious thing to do. Factor out V over R. And I end up with 1 minus e to the minus t final over L over R. And let me do the thing that I've been doing so far. So I don't really want to be talking about the final time. This uh, t final really is a stand-in for the variable time. And this e i final is really i as a function of time. Ohm, the register here is 100 ohm. So you could actually ignore this. So, uh, but I want you to focus on the property of the inductor itself, not the fact that it's ideal. Like what about the inductor allows you to ignore it? Towards the end of this, uh, towards the end of this charging cycle, because that definitely wasn't the case with the capacitor. With the capacitor, you know, when it got fully charged up, it dropped the entire voltage of the battery, so that there was no more current flowing. But with the inductor, we are saying almost what sounds like the exact opposite thing. We are saying that when it's fully charged, we can kind of ignore the influence of the inductor altogether. 
Yes? Because there's less change of current or change of current approaches zero? Yeah, so you still focus on this, di dt. So you look at the rate of change of current. And as Chris said, well, when you are done increasing current, it, the rate of change is going to go to zero, which means change of voltage across the inductor is going to be zero. So all of the battery's voltage, now all of the battery's voltage now drops across the register. So that makes sense that this is the current that will be flowing when, once that happens. But yeah, the behavior of inductor is very curious. Um, it's uh, unintuitive. It takes a while to get used to. That's why this is the expression you should rely on. And I will say in this uh, maximum's case, inductor is not actually doing nothing. It's actually stored energy. And um, so how inductor stored energy? Uh, that's the easiest to see in what we call LC circuit, inductor capacitor circuit. Um, 